Okay, welcome back to the Esports Research Report podcast. I'm Dr. Brian McCauley here in Yen Shepping. And as we gear up for our conference this November in the city of DreamHack, what we're doing now is we're going to bring you some of our summer series, which is the fantastic work by our ERN graduate student committee, Evelyn Tan, Bo Yu, and Ivan Vanilla. So they did a summer panel series live on Twitch and they did some great talks with wonderful guests. So first up today is the topic of women in play with Nicholas Taylor, who's an associate professor at the North Carolina State University. Medea, Medea Madi Naz, who is the esports athlete and gamer relationship agent at Division. And Maria Rousseline, a doctoral candidate. Well, she was a doctoral candidate, but now she's actually a doctor at the University of Yeskvaliva, or however it's spoken, it's, it's a Finnish word. So. Enjoy this fantastic series and initiative by our members of our graduate student committee. So we'll start with, let's start with Nick, as I was, you know, most of the way through and then no one heard me, so. That's fine. Thanks, Evelyn. Um, I have a little bit of news actually that uh, the the blurb, the bio I sent last week is already a little bit outdated. Um, oh. uh, I signed uh, I signed a, a new contract with York University in Toronto, Canada, uh, two days ago uh, to become an associate professor in the Department of Communication and Media Studies at York, which is where I defended my PhD from back in uh, 2012. So I'm I'm returning home both to my um, the institution that trained me and to the 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 country that raised me. So. Um, getting repatriated back into Canada. Um, but I'm still going to serve as, as a visiting senior scholar at Abo Academy University in Vasa, Finland, uh, starting in August. And I'll be uh, kind of next door neighbors with uh, folks um, like Maria, who are doing some incredible research in esports and gaming and diversity and inclusivity. So um, as you were saying, Evelyn, my work um, kind of broadly applies post-humanist philosophy and uh, uh, intersectional feminist theory to qualitative and ethnographic research on uh, communities that take place seriously. That includes, um, as you said, Lego fanatics, uh, of which I count myself one, and uh, um, uh, esports players, spectators, community organizers, and so on. And that's recently manifested as uh, a whole lot of work on collegiate esports and efforts to make the collegiate esports scene a little more welcoming and inclusive. So thank you. Thank you so much for letting me be here. Great. Thanks so much, Nick. And we'll move on to Maria. Uh, right. Hello. So I'm uh, Maria and I'm uh, currently finishing my um, PhD in the University of Jyväskylä. So I should be defending in a month if everything goes as it should be. Um, and my, uh, in my PhD, I look at the uh, way uh, gender and nationality are necoded within the Overwatch esports, and a lot of my research has circulated around uh, at, at these topics, so uh, gender and nationality in esports, and um, I'm particularly interested in the way that um, not only the players, but the viewers, the audience, and the, the media uh, participates in negotiating uh, the way gender uh, and nationality are constructed within esports. Um, I've also looked in, in my research, looked into some uh, uh, intersection of populism and masculinities, hate speech. So that's a bit of an earlier research before going to uh, move into research of esports and um, uh, currently, I'm uh, uh, doing the, e the research on esports, on gender, on diversity, and also uh, also uh, looking at the way um, uh, masculinities are negotiated in esports. Great, thank you so much. And Maddie, would you like to tell us about yourself? Sure. So I am Maddie. Uh, I'm an esports athlete. I was playing professionally. Um, under an organization here in the Middle East uh, for two years. And I became the first Pakistani female to enter esports professionally. And we were also the first ever Middle Eastern all-female team as well. And uh, we, I still have a team. We're all females, but currently free agents. Besides that, I'm I've also just joined a new role at a digital platform called Division. It's launching in September, first in the Middle Eastern region as well. And uh, we basically provide gamers 
uh, many cool opportunities such as brand collaborations for any type of gamer. It doesn't matter if you're male, female, casual gamer, pro gamer. Uh, we also host tournaments and we uh, give gamers the option, gamers or brands, the option to uh, create events as well and a possibility of them getting sponsored by the brands we have on board. Great. So um, for the audience, in case you didn't, didn't catch, we have quite a, a diverse range of speakers today, not just in terms of what they do and their backgrounds, but also like where they come from. I think within our speaker pool, we have Maddie, who's sort of representing, I guess, Dubai, Middle East. And then we have Maria, who's currently based in Finland. And we have Nick, who's currently based in the US, but is Canadian. And Bo is American, based in Texas. And I'm here based in York. So I think it's one of the beautiful things to the eSports network is we really do bring people together from all across the world to hear their perspectives and, and find new ways to push um, both research and just move the whole esports industry forward. So with that, let's just um, dive in to some of the questions we'd like to cover today. Um, and anyone can take the floor. Um, don't feel shy and don't sort of like hesitate. If you have something to say, just go ahead and say it. So what has, in terms of the demographic of, of people, of professional players, streamers, the audience, casual gamers, how has that changed um, in the last five years? Um, anyone wants to pick it up can can go ahead first. Okay, Maddie, I see you. Big smiles. Uh, I would say as a gamer who grew up in the UAE and following the Middle Eastern scene for a very long time, I would say there was a massive boom in the region in the last three years, right before COVID. Uh, there were two major tournaments that happened, uh, offline events. One happened in Saudi Arabia and then one took place, which was surprisingly a huge tournament happening in Dubai for the first time dedicated to esports and it was for females. It was called Girl Gamer and that's where I debuted as a team as well. My team debuted as well. And I feel like ever since then, there's been this massive growth where the player base has grown so much. So many casual gamers are looking for um, opportunities and uh, you can find them now basically and there's so many more content creators influencers uh entering the market as well so it, it's been nice to see how much we've grown it's already a billion dollar industry as well the middle east and it only took such little amounts of time so i'm excited to see what's more to come great and how so you said the girl gamer um competition or the league that debuted uh maybe like three years ago perhaps two three years ago um do you know how that sort of came to be? Like what the, what might have the factors have been that have sort of led such a, a competition of that scale and for women as well um, happen? Um, so basically I know there was qualifications, qu qualifiers, sorry, not qualifications, yeah. qualifiers happening in uh, different regions where there were female gamers already. So there was one in EU, there was one in Brazil, uh, Australia, and then I think there was one in France and then there wasn't one for the Middle East. And that's kind of when I took initiative and when the press conference happened that the worlds, so all those right. qualifiers, all those winners were going to come compete for worlds here in Dubai. And when I heard that was happening, I was like, why is there no Middle Eastern representation of females at this tournament? <laughs> so I went to the organizers and I'm like, OK, you know what? We need to create a team. And uh, they were like, we didn't even know there were female gamers here, <laughs> basically. So that's when my team were ma was made. And I feel like uh, when other organizations saw that, okay, there's female gamers, let's, let's start this. I feel like it all kind of fell, fell into effect and things started happening in terms of esports in the region. Yeah, well, that, that's really interesting. The sort of, like the extent that people didn't know that female gamers exist, but I think, in the last four or five years, we've really seen the stats change in terms of who plays games, right? It's very much a 50-50 split now. And I think maybe, Nick, you can bring uh, some of your insight into this, as you brought up earlier, um, that females or, or women or have really been in the esports and gaming scene for much longer than people think. Um, Nick, do you want to come and chime in? Uh, yeah, thank you for the invitation. Um, yeah, I think, you know... I, I... I think research, uh, us as esports researchers often um, pay uh, maybe a myopic attention to the practices and perspectives of, of players because 
you know, that's where the action is, right? That's kind of the, the obvious unit of analysis when considering esports. It's, you know, the action happening on screen and the players behind it. Um, but I think, um, you know, uh, as we've expanded our scope to kind of include um, other facets of the industry, um, you know, some of us as researchers have kind of gone, holy cow, there's actually women participating here for a long time. And it's, it's been like that since the beginning. And so um, one of the things that I'm trying to be very attentive to uh, as someone who's been involved, not only in research, but in community organizing on the collegiate side for the last five years, is really considering um, what the kind of the formalization of the North American collegiate scene means um, in, uh, uh, at a, in a university context where, you know, universities are so ostensibly dedicated more so than maybe professional industries to um, issues of diversity and inclusion. Um, and so I think one of the things we're seeing is that even as you know the player base at the collegiate level uh, is is kind of being um, you know concretized to be primarily male, um, that esports is offering a lot of opportunities at the collegiate level for uh, all sorts of other forms of participation for um, women and other gender minorities. And I'm thinking here of things like nutritionists, um, team counselors, team managers, event organizers. Um, you know, I, I know Maddie has a public relations background. That's a huge, you know, there's a huge opportunity for uh, PR folks. There's a lot of kind of historically uh, female dominated fields that have an opportunity here and that we're seeing that opportunity to develop, to get involved in esports. So um, can you name more... a few of those female dominated fields? Yeah, public relations, right. um, uh, event management, communications, uh, social media content creation. Um, right. Uh, you know, um, I think, you know, kinesiology, um, I, don't quote me on that, uh, but sports psychology, uh, these are all fields that are a little more diverse than I think the kind of computer centric fields that we tend to think of when we think of as esports. And I think that's, I think we need to continue to kind of uh, take that broad and holistic view of esports as engaging lots more forms of participation, other than just players, not to kind of you know, not to kind of lose sight of the efforts to make esports playing a little more inclusive, but um, recognizing that that um, there are some there are some women pioneers that have been around in the esports scene for a long time, and and you know, and, and there there's folks like Maddie kind of coming in every all the time now, and more often I think um, to participate in in ways beyond play. So, are there some um, specific women that come to mind when you think about women who've been in the scene but maybe have not been? Um, spotlighted or made as visible that we should know of? From my own perspective, I think, um, uh, you know, I've, um, uh, um, I get to work with some incredible women on the Riot Scholastic Advisory Board, you know, Ashley Miller-Hodge, Caroline uh, Henry, um, uh, you know, um, I think uh, Shelby Ulysse at, at Riot, who led up the Game Changers program, um, is another kind of behind the scenes kind of force for good and esports inclusivity. I right. also think of folks like Morgan Romine, who heads up any key um, uh, and who worked with TL Taylor on that kind of pioneering uh, initiative for years. Um, uh, Susie Kim, who was, uh, you know, who I met 10 years ago as a, in one of my trips to England and who was at the time a, a translator for a South Korean esports team and who went on to become, you know, the manager of the, of the London Overwatch team. You know, there's, there's, there's endless, um, examples, I think, but th okay. they're often invisible, kind of, you know, in the kind of day to day, yeah, um, esports spectacle, right? And I think I think our job as academics is to kind of highlight those and, and make those more visible, so that um, you know, young women out there can see that you know, hey, I can become involved in, I can become involved in this and, and find a sense of belonging here. Yeah, totally. I think for me, one of the people who I've uh, who I feel is really influential woman in this space is Anna Donlan, who is the I think she's the uh, executive producer for Valorant and a lot of her decisions have made Valorant such a sort of attractive game for women um, and yes Maria do you want to come and come add to that point please please oh, do uh, finish your point I just didn't want to talk over you so ah uh, okay please do finish yeah. your point no that was all I think it's just like knowing that this game which is you know FPS is is historically very male oriented you know you know, it comes from the CSGO time of era, um, but to see a game that really just from the get-go attracts so many women to play um, and to see that you had a, a, a woman influencing the development kind of just shows sort of, I guess, how important we need to include other, other people in the scene. Um, but that's all I wanted to say. I was just admiring Anne Donlan. Uh, <laughs> Maria, please. 
Uh, right, so I wanted to kind of continue on the discussion of like diversifying uh, what we think is part of esports, and we think of when we think about the esport uh, ecosystem or esports scene, who who is part of it if you own the players. But uh, not just to think about that in terms of diversity, but also like what it's esports in itself is in terms of diversity. So I think one of the things that is diversity currently working on diversifying uh, the field of esports is the change of a what kind of games are considered esports. So that is becoming um, that is becoming uh, uh, more diverse. But also how esports can be accessed. So if we think of mobile gaming big becoming and mobile esports becoming uh, big in a, a, lot, a lot of locations, including the global south. So it is also gives an access not only to more women player, and we know from research uh, uh, from India, from Pakistan, that if, for instance there, there is a lot of women playing uh, esports uh, through mobile devices. Uh, and this kind of accessibility, I think we need to um, we need to look at intersectionally as well. So it's not just woman participation, but it's also right. also like uh, inter it's it, it, it's uh, intersecting with the locality and questions of who can participate in general. Um, the other thing um, I was thinking and listening all these super interesting conversations we are having here is that I completely agree with Nick that we have to really like bring forth and recognize all these other kind of uh, forces, so to say, all the other kind of actors in the uh, in the esports ecosystems. But at the same time, I want us to be careful not to expect the woman to just be in certain kind of roles of which of quite commonly are that of affective labor. Uh, and then there, there becomes so I, I so this is definitely not the point here, but this is kind of fun to add to the point we already made. Um, so not the point this, this point that it's not saying that everyone here is suggesting this, but to add on this is to like at the same time I think it's very important that we 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 uh, continue to create the kind of uh, space in esports that women can be players too and competitive players because when you look at the um, uh, Places like Overwatch, for instance, which is known as some, somewhat like friendly, um, friendly esports for women, especially in terms of Evelyn already discussed a little bit about the uh, first-person shooters being traditionally historically been seen this kind of uh, genuinely quite toxic places, especially for minor minority group players. So if you look at the Overwatch, which, which has this kind of fun rhetoric of access, acceptance and diversity design uh, around it how true it might be, even there, like women players are constantly told to, even when they play the game, to take the effective roles of only being asked to play certain roles or certain ways. And you can really see this becoming a normative way to perform femininity within this game. So the, like at the same time, it's so important we have women into different roles, but at the same time, we need to continuously work on keeping the other roles open for everyone, regardless of their gender, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right, yeah, for, for sure. So I guess, the other sort of just made me think of like how women are typically in a lot of competitive team based games, women are typically thought to take the support roles, right? And they should be sort of maybe encouraged to play more, I don't know, like jungler roles or center roles if you're, if you're playing like mobile games or, you know, just more entry fragger roles. Um, but uh, I think I wanted to, to move to touch a little bit on what you said, Maria, whether there are are there certain esports communities that are more friendly towards women and, and why might be the case if so? If not, then, you know. So um, I was actually thinking this question earlier because there's probably like we cannot, I, I think there is one thing is that we most likely won't be able to fully to deduce it down to a particular title, but we have to look at different kind of ways that esports is engaged with. So if it's engaged locally or if it's engaged in the kind of ladder play, uh, but certainly um, there is at least this kind of rhetorics and discourses of uh, different games being more friendly uh, towards women, uh, women players or towards minority players. And definitely, I think this discourse we all are familiar with the uh, first person shooter games being um, hostile places, Counter Strike, uh, Call of Duty, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that those are uh, has, have traditionally been. Uh, uh, more toxic for minority players. And uh, then there is games like Overwatch, which are based on diversity design and as such also champion different kind of heroes than 
than the classic uh, white man playing, uh, which has been suggested by some researchers to be something that uh, engages larger audiences. Um, my own research has also suggested that having this kind of different uh, representation does does uh, have it make a difference on the players. But I, I still think like we cannot just stare at that because we have to really look at the like practices within the game and the way the way way the diversity is handled at, at, as a part of the gameplay, not just as a kind of on the representational level. But maybe someone yeah. else has more to add to this. Yeah, Nick or Maddie? Uh, I can go. <laughs> so I think as someone who's been in the community, and I would say overall, if I were to think of uh, one community that seems more friendlier to women, uh, I would think maybe Valorant, because the game developer itself has acknowledged females and they've given them a league of their own to participate in. I don't think any game developer has taken such an initiative. I mean, I play League of Legends and I'm kind of jealous, jealous of the Valorant folks here because uh, it's just a lot of toxicity going on. But none to say, to add on to my point, I even though they have it a bit easier in that sense, I, I still think Females do uh, face a lot of toxicity when they try to turn on their mic in game. So that factor is still there. But I think uh, because of this initiative taken by Riot, this will definitely slow it down in the years, hopefully. Yeah, there was a very famous um, band, the Riot bandless Valorant player, this one of the streamers who shouted really bad sort of derogatory um, female oriented slurs. Um, and to his audience, I don't know if you know, is this guy who was like just really shouting at his teammate who was a, a, a woman's voice telling him to calm down and whatnot. Um, and I think that sort of very public, immediate sort of we don't support this kind of behavior is really encouraging for like women trying to, to play in this scene. So yeah, definitely like Valorant. Yeah, it's one of these, I think it's, it's one of the better efforts that's been made to make it more inclusive for women. But touching on sort of like the, the leagues for women, do you think, and this is open to the floor, um, whether there are any obvious advantages or disadvantages to having such leagues? So I guess one of the advantages I can think of off the top of my head is that if you have a women league, you just have more women coming into play because they feel less, um, I guess, there's, there's less pressure or uh, it's just a more acceptable place for them to play. But um, yes, Maddie, were you gonna raise your hand? Yeah, I was. I don't know why, but <laughs> I have a good point to that. So sure. basically, I think the benefits to having women only leagues. So I remember when I first started, I didn't even know there was the esports community or competitions. I didn't know there was Twitch, Discord. I was just a gamer and I happened to be good at it, not to have an ego, but hey. I found that out later. I didn't, I didn't know I was good at it. Okay. So I think what a huge benefit to having women only leagues is that it creates a safe zone for a newcomer to come in and feel comfortable. If right. she were to step into uh, an environment where unfortunately females are already looked down upon, uh, I feel like she would be self-conscious about things like, uh, am I being judged on my performance because I'm a female? And I've seen this happen, amazing females, who have been playing in the female scene for so long, and then they go into, uh, I don't want to say a male team, but another a team where majority, team. a male dominated team, exactly. Yeah. And she, the whole tournament became about how a female is joining and uh, her performance was judged so massively on just the fact that she was a female. And uh, there were males who had, worse performances than her but of course that wouldn't be talked about because that's just a bad day for a guy right mm -hmm. but for the girl it's it's way worse so i think there there's benefits but there's disadvantages as well yeah i think it's really interesting because you know from what i from what i know there's no particular esport that says that has any requirement on gender so it doesn't have to be an all-male team or an all-female team and yet all the teams are mostly male. So that's that's kind of interesting. I just want to hear maybe Nick, I, I see you nodding a lot. I feel like you probably have some thoughts on this. 
Yeah, I, 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 I love Maddie's perspective as a player. Um, uh, you know, I, I think this has been an ongoing debate for like the better part of two decades, right? Ever since like, like I think it was Frag Girls kind of stepped on the scene, right? And and I think you know the there was you know um, kind of a, a, an external perspective on some of those early um, all female esports squads was like, oh, it's like a marketing gimmick. But if you actually talk to the women, including Morgan Romine, who was one of the early, you know, I think kind of the captain of Frag uh, Frag Dolls, I think it was, um, you know, she's like, we're all really good. This is just the only, like, pretty much the only way we can get to play. And even though we're better, you know, as Maddie was saying, then you know, half, if not all of our male counterparts. I remember, um, you know, when I was doing my research on the Halo 3 scene back in like 2000 BC um, uh, in Toronto, there was like, um, there was one female gamer, right? Um, uh, in, in this kind of grassroots competitive scene. And she had to struggle so hard just to be accepted. And she was still kind of met with routine um mundane forms of harassment right and so and she was better than three quarters of the people in there she she could beat them hands down any day of the week right bad day or not um and so i think female leagues uh are are an excellent partial solution right um i don't want to say temporary solution because i think they've been around for a while and they they ought to be around for a while but i think they're a partial solution right and i think I think one of the things that we've all pointed to is this persistence on the part of kind of esports cultures um, to perpetually favor male players. And I don't think that's because of anything innate, right? I think it's because historically men have more access to leisure time and to the technologies used to play video games intensively, right? And I think until that changes, we need things like female leagues as intervention mechanisms to develop um, the talent and the the sense of belonging that women can bring, right? Um, uh, and I think, you know, alongside that ought to be things like the very deliberate, careful rollout of a community building, inclusive community building, that's something like Valorant has done, which we've all pointed to, right? And Riot is hyper aware of where they messed up with League of Legends, right? And, and so yes. Valorant is really, right? Yeah, exactly. Valorant is really like, like take two, right? Um, uh, and so they're being very deliberate and cautious and reflective about how they're rolling that out. I think that alongside um, greater attention in the collegiate scene and other amateur scenes to um, to basically making safe and equitable conditions for women to come in, right? Um, and and you know, as as Maria said, you know, um, everyone kind of thinks about what they're going to do after esports. And so I think, you know, Maria was kind of uh, brought attention to the to the fact that a lot of the kind of the forms of participation that I was mentioning are often, you know, the kind of feminized forms of participation are often underpaid, underrecognized, invisible. So I think part of the effort of ironically making the player base more inclusive is making other esports careers uh, more formalized, better compensated, better organized, more visible, right? And and so I think um, I you know I, I'm I'm a fan of female leagues, but I see them as a as one solution and one strategy among many. And I, I you know I hope I'm not off base there. I think I, I I kind of agree with you there. And really interesting that you mentioned about the different sort of career trajectories or career paths you can take, because that's what our next panel is going to be about. Um, actually, on different uh, ways you can get into esports besides professional play. But um, I like to hear a bit about Maria. I feel like you um you were nodding and you had some. I feel like you have some things to say. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, a lot of the things that I've, I'm thinking about this particular topic were already mentioned uh, by Maddie and Nika. Uh, so um, kind of embracing what that's been said here that I agree that like uh, women leagues, female leagues um, um, and, and uh, minority leagues are a great way to create these safe spaces uh, where people can participate without, because it's so much work to perform your gender in a way that is acceptable if you're a woman. I'm sure Maddie could just keep telling us about this, but it's so much damn work to, and how are you gonna ever like focus on playing the game? When like 90% of your energy goes into thinking, are you properly performing your gender now in a way that is acceptable for
for those who, uh, you are playing with. Uh, so I think a lot of women players that uh, there is some great work, some great research, uh, for instance, women in Movitkovsky, I think, looking at the ways women players are also very aware about this kind of fun uh, situation they are in where they have told and think the ways they can build from their gender and the, the ways they can sort of, sort of do this kind of gender offense almost, how they can stretch the lines of the ways they can exist within the uh, esports uh, economy. Uh, but if you just think about it, like, like that, that, of course that uh, it is kind of identity negotiations and are not solely for women and other minority players uh, or minority group players, but it's so visible and it's such a big part of their everyday play experience that it's actually it's actually not that they are still being able to play and function or participate uh, the, the esports at all. So in that sense, it's I think women league are are definitely welcome and needed. Um, uh, to for that to create these spaces where you, you can actually focus on the play. However, it's not unproblematic because of, often these leagues tend to have less resources put into them, less prize money. They are ex even expected to have less audiences, and then there is also the tendency, of which is a bit of the, the, the last decade, but we still see it popping up uh, uh, of uh, very much objectifying the women players uh, in a way that not all the players necessarily feel well, uh, happy or comfortable with. Uh, the other thing that I think is problematic is that, of course, it keeps creating this uh, idea that there, there needs to be like, uh, we here talk about the reasons why we need these different leagues, and it's like obvious, okay, we need these same spaces, but then there is also these different leagues are used for other kind of rhetorics of like, why would we have different leagues for women and men, um, or men and uh, others. So I think like it is indeed a partial solution, but it cannot be the only solution. And also then we have to make sure that we have resources going for those leagues as well, and um, that they, the players are getting <laughs> paid for what they do there as well. Yeah. Well, so following up on that question, then what do you think um, esports either organizers or developers, team owners, tournament organizers, how can they sort of get involved to make um, getting into esports more accessible for women and minority groups. Um, anyone can take the floor for this. Maria, you want to go first? You're ready. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was watching Maddie. I'm like, there's something great coming out again because she's to she seems to really have her fingers on the pulse on these kind of questions. Uh, but I'll go first. Uh, so I think like uh, like one thing was already sort of uh, brought up and mentioned, it's this kind of fun, uh, really quick judging of the ways that with kind of behavior is unwanted and sort of like really breaking off this kind of fun, um, uh, traditional culture markers, but it needs to be an esport. So there's this certain kind of very masculine uh, and a culture that about that sort of toxic masculinity is very rampant in the chance in a lot of the esports cultures. So really like- Like, like calling it out? Yeah, instantly calling it out, not playing around with it. Like, just calling it calling it out instantly and distancing uh, uh distancing oneself from it so that's one part of it the other part is of course the very practical things we already talked about the uh creating a, 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 a woman and minority leagues uh, creating uh, making it so that you know that like this is ridiculous uh in the first season of the overwatch league one of the teams was supposed to sign the korean woman player uh, playing under the game that Kiguri. And they, they give reason that they didn't sign her because they had like uh, otherwise all men team and they would be all sharing a house. So they found found it, it was hard to create player accommodation for someone of different gender. Then we have like rules that this cannot be the case. Like that the teams cannot just go around and say, yeah, okay, we just couldn't be ours to have a one more room or like it's just ridiculous because it it, it is not the, the it's not there's been cases with the women coaches that have not been hired because some of the men players might not be comfortable under a woman coach can we just like put it in the rules that this kind of stuff can't fly so like really like it's just sometimes there's too much um, uh, towing around with these issues like some things just should not be the case like these kind of things yeah. just should not be happening so it sounds like there needs to be sort of like a top-down change in sort of upper management upper management's approach to, to how they, they include women um and, and other minority groups in in the group 
Right. This is, of course, the esports dependent, like because yeah. different esports have such a different ecosystem. So it's like how it can be actually done it is dependent, like who has the power and who rules, so to say. But it can be done differently in different esports, but it should be done. I think. Yeah. OK. And Nick, I, I know you have some ideas on this. Um, and I'd love to hear them. Yeah, I think, you know, um, uh, again, I'd, I'd, I'd kind of point folks over to anykey.org and the work that they've been doing on on making just really kind of common sense and obvious tools for things like hosting a safe esports party, right? Or like um, if you're forming a university club around esports, here are some things you can do to make all sorts of folks feel welcome. And it's like, gee, like post a code of conduct in a visible place, right? including on a, like front and center on a discord, right? Not just physically, and then make it actionable, right? And I think, you know, um, uh, I, I think if we, you know, make kind of obvious, but deliberate um, uh, uh, policies and procedures around inclusivity and equity at the kind of points of entry into formalized esports places, um, then that that doesn't just kind of perform a punitive role to people, you know, like to the dudes who still don't get it, but it also kind of signals to other folks that hey, like you know, maybe I can give this a shot um, because uh, there is support for me, right? Um, I think you know, I th I think female players are out there. We don't have to like we, we don't have to like invent them, right? They're like I think they you know as see Maddie nodding along, which means like yes, um, but like we just have to kind of support them right um uh, and i think you know you mentioned a kind of top-down approach i think it you know esports is kind of one um you know it's an industry around the organized you know televisual spectacle of competitive gaming but competitive gaming itself as the thing the the material of esports could do a lot better job of of um kind of uh making like everyday matches you know pickup matches in league of legends valorant overwatch um, you know, I know it's been a, a, like a decade long struggle with making better um, uh, uh, and more deliberate and more transparent uh, community management tools and anti harassment tools, but to maybe double down on those efforts um, uh, and, and to make them front and center, I think, so that, you know, uh, we know, for instance, that the pipeline into kind of even amateur and professional um, esports uh, esports industries are um, is just esports culture, and if we leave it up to this historically masculinized culture, we're not going to get it done. And so maybe we work on kind of changing this to the grassroots level, and I think that can happen by, um, as we've all been saying, having developers kind of signal that you know enough is enough. Um, you know, yeah. I think that's my two cents. Great, and um, Maddie, I, yeah, you're nodding along as well. Um, I'm sure you have quite a lot to say on this uh, topic, so please feel free to share your thoughts. I think I agree with everything uh, Nick and Maria had said, but just to add on uh, to Nick's point is that we don't have to invent women. They're already there, provide opportunities for them. Like my example from earlier, girl, girl gamer was happening. And before that I had heard of nothing to do with esports in the country. So when that happened, my team formed and that's okay. Five girl gamers, five, women gamers for League of Legends. And then the next year it happened again. And there was, so it started from one team. And then last year, my team won the thing, but there was about, I think, 12 teams in total. How many players is that? That's like- 60. 80? Oh, okay, 60. 60 yeah. <laughs> uh, that's like 60 players, uh, 60 female players from it just being five. You provide them one opportunity and so many step out. It's just lack of opportunities for females, I would say. People need to follow, uh, game developers need to follow in footstep of Valorant game changers or Riot. Uh, provide official female tournaments. You're not losing anything, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> and um, I think the media needs to be supportive as well. Uh, so many articles are done about, okay, women are facing bullying and gaming and how many more female gamers there are than men. Why don't you showcase the accomplishments women have done in esports instead of talking about what's 
what they're facing. Talk about what good has came out of it. So yeah. basically panels like these need to happen more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, so I just want to follow up on that. So of all the, can you tell us, can you shed light on some of the really good things that women have done in this space? I think I had one more question about how women have influenced um, the industry and what other changes we can expect to see or, or hope for in the future as a, as a result of increased visibility and representation. Sure. So I can talk about Lucy Chow. She was one of the first females I met at Girl oh, yeah. Gamer, and she's written a book. Uh, she She's done so much for the esports scene, and she continuously spreads light about female gamers as well. There's one of my uh, ex-teammates. Her name is Moki. She's the first Emirati female League of Legends player. We debuted together. Uh, she broke stereotypes and competed. It was so hard three years ago to get any Emirati females to compete on the main stage because of you know certain cultural beliefs that we have here. Mm -hmm. And she went against them all and she became the first. I mean, there's, there's a huge list sure and i'm sure as as a result of that there's a lot more emirati women coming joining the scene I've, out of seeing players like her and obviously players like you and and that there's definitely more than one team of female players out there honestly uh and this is not to brag but i am happy what uh galaxy racer enigma galaxy as they yeah. as they've rebranded they set a very very good example of how organizations should treat their players because they had they came into the market with both male and female players and i feel like when people came and asked me oh but do you feel like it's for you know marketing purposes thank god i had a background in marketing as well <laughs> because i would have as a gamer i would have not known what they're talking about and i'm like no i have a coach i have a manager they're barely using me for anything mark i'm using my own voice to get the message out but they're they're giving me a proper schedule of how i can continue to improve my talent. Anything else, it's out of my option. They're not, they didn't force me to do anything marketing wise, so. Right, so they were, they were just genuinely interested in you as a player, regardless of your, your agenda in this case. It's just, they want to support you to become the best player you can be in the world, right? Yes, I would say f that was my experience. Right. Okay, well, um, I think those are all the questions we had sort of like prepared, but we got to open the floor now to um, the audience to see what, what kind of questions they have. And we've got one right here. It said, um, you mentioned that women face toxicity in games. What do you think the esports community could do to help improve the toxic culture against women? Anyone can take the floor here. Um, so I can start. So I think some of these things that we already discussed are definitely helpful. Um, for instance, uh, uh, Nick brought, uh, brought up the, uh, uh, the visibility of code of conduct, for instance, and that yeah. it actually is there, uh, not just as a punitive measure, but as something to, to sort of si constantly signal the, that the, all kind of players are welcome. And I think that goes beyond uh, 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 that that goes beyond the code of conduct. Also, how that's just kind of in general, what kind of visuals we have in terms of like organizations, uh, websites, etc., etc. Something me and uh, Matilda Stan Uso Freeman have been looking in our research is that like uh, th th there's a ways of signal signaling uh, uh, inclusivity, um, and there's ways of ex excluding just by the, the uh, uh, just by the aesthetics alone. Mm -hmm. So it's 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 really important that we we showcase that that players can be diverse, and I think sometimes it's also important to go the extra mile in a way, and not just say that we, we welcome diversity, but actually to really put a, like uh, like a really highlight that, really go the extra mile for that. Um, and one of the things that's I think super helpful in terms of esports communities is to have these uh, communities for women players, uh, for minority groups that that often are open for men players as well. But uh, for instance. I was playing Overwatch at some point with uh, point the team that we had a 50-50 rule. So uh, we had to have 50% uh, of the players have to be uh, a woman or, or other gender than men. 
And that was the first time I, in the, while playing in an organized plate, I got to play some other role than a support player. Because I mean, I played in the mixed teams, which always were all men teams, always. And uh, this is very casually playing, but still. Um, it was usually always the case that I play, ended up playing a support or flex support role. And when I played with this team that we had the 50 50 role, I finally got to play a hit scan uh, role. And that was amazing. And it was really made possible by uh, this kind of community. Uh, where these teams were hosted. So I think this kind of about just the creating of these kind of communities, um, it, uh, it's really this, because we talk about the women's leagues of safe spaces, but this happens in the all level of play. And I think like looking at the like, if, if uh, there's always this question as to why is there so little woman at the, at the top of the uh, esports? Because it's, you don't just jump on the top, you go through a path, a path to get there. And it is this path where it happens that a lot of women just, say like yeah i'm not going to do this because look at what i'm facing um so like we really need to make think ways how we make like uh, a ladder play uh better for women that's through different kind of communities for instance one way and really like a local organizations engaging with esports and like we have some of that being in finland like esports uh, workshops or esports youth clubs for young players of from 8 to 12 or so and so on and they tend to be mainly boys so and they say of course we are open to everyone that's not enough we have to actively make it uh, open just saying that anyone can come and then there is going to be uh, then boys it's it's I don't think it's enough yeah so I really like the idea of like a 50 50 rule team composition for um you know in competitions I think that kind of signals that we're all equal because I know sometimes when I play with my friends as well if and most of my friends are guys who play these games when we play I always just tend towards the support role because I was like oh they're always everyone else is just better at me at all these other roles um but that's just sort of like, I think, culturally culturally ingrained from playing games for so long and seeing that shift. So, yeah, uh, definitely. Um, this, Maddie, did you have something to add to this about how the esports community can, what can they do to help people, to help um, improve the toxic culture against women? I can talk about the newer generation because I feel like it's a bit too late for my own, <laughs> but that's my personal opinion. But what I would say is maybe there should be some kind of mentoring programs and uh, really teaching the youth about how important equality is, because even though they have us as an example right now, it's still very shaky because they can think so am I supposed to be toxic to women or am I not? And obviously you shouldn't, but there should be a program in place where they can learn that it doesn't matter what your gender is. Everyone is equal. You play the game to play the game. You don't play the game and bash on someone because of what their gender is. Right, yeah. Can I add to that a little bit? Because that's such a great point. And I think that's a very concrete, um, good suggestion. And I think together with that is um, something I've been uh, working with my colleague, Nick Pamerilainen, with the um, uh, you, young players. And one of the things we noticed in our research that like a lot of the time there is this kind of a lack of how to deal with your emotions. And a lot of the rage is also competitive rage. And it gets mixed up with, of course, this kind of toxic mass, uh, structures of, structures of uh, um, toxicity within the games and uh, uh, toxic meritocracy, toxic masculinity, but there is also this kind of um, uh, this kind of fun lack of um, how to how to deal with your own emotions or frustrations, for instance, and that often turns into a toxicity. So, like mentoring programs of of uh, about like how do you deal with uh, people from different groups, but also like how do you deal with yourself? How do you deal with that emotional pressure uh, that com bring competitive games causes? So, of course, like you go at the top of the top esports you will have coaches for that but like when you're playing you know the ladder play and it doesn't go just like you want it you all you know know the feeling how it feels yeah. so how do we how do we deal with that so that's like i think uh, like uh again this kind of a mentoring and this kind of a game game skills that are not supposed to how to play the game but how to be a good teammate in a way for sure um okay um we're just gonna take another two more questions. We've got five minutes, so try and keep our answers short and concise. Um, a question from the audience, toxicity aside, I would love to know what other barriers to entry exist for young female players and what we can do to encourage and support them to overcome them. Does the panel know of any grassroots support venues for grassroots support avenues for these promising ladies to help them get started? So I guess it's two questions. 
One is other barriers to entry for young female players, and whether there are any grassroots support avenues for upcoming uh, female players. Maybe maybe Nick might be a good one to answer this question. Actually, Oof. Um, all right. Um, uh, you, you know, I I think I would just kind of amplify what Maddie and Maria have said already, which is uh, I love the idea of of mentorship programs. I think those can be relatively. Um, you know, I think we're seeing. We're seeing schools get into esports in a, uh, uh, or esports get into schools, I should say, in a pretty kind of concerted way, right? Uh, it's hard to tell which direction that's going. Yeah. Um, my worry is that um, with the kind of the rush to kind of formalize uh, esports at a first collegiate and then frequently um, like high school level, that um, they're just going to kind of follow the lead of the pro leagues and kind of just take whoever's best in the class at that time. I think we really need to take seriously that esports talent is learned, right? And that anyone can learn it. <laughs> like it's like this is this is kind of just, you know, we've 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 done this before with computers, right? I remember like reading articles on on computer education in the 1980s. It was like women can learn computers too. And like, duh, of course they can. Women were the first computer pioneers, right? And so I think um, same thing with game development. We're seeing the same thing with game development. I think we need to kind of just say, right, uh, uh, you know, esports are are a set of learned competencies that anyone can pick up and take that seriously, right? Um, and and you know, as esports infiltrate educational institutions, which is already happening and it's going to increase happening, increasingly increasingly happen we can use that the like formal educational systems as levers to say, all right, if this is really gonna happen, then let's make sure this happens equitably, right? We need um, uh, female leaders in schools. We need female mentors. We need, uh, we need to kind of give space and time for everyone who wants to get involved to get better, right? Because that's what I think one of the barriers that, that, that is constantly kind of uh, has constantly hindered women who want to get into gaming more generally is that, um, uh, you know, they have to fight extra hard. They have to do double the work in order to kind of just feel articulate and, and, and develop a sense of belonging. You know, they have to be twice as good as the dudes. This is even before, you know, this is regardless of, you know, formalized youth sports or not, they just have to be twice as good as the guy beside them in order to feel accepted. And I think, um, uh, I think we can do a series of interventions kind of at an early age um, uh, in educational spaces that are kind of faced with this question of, do I let esports into the door to yeah. kind of um, use education as a lever? So I know you've talked about um, collegiate esports, uh, collegiate programs, but I, I think I read somewhere that like sort of, even with collegiate programs, and maybe you mentioned it earlier as well, you still see a, a minority of women and, and other groups coming in. And, you know, obviously in those environments, I don't expect to be as toxic as if you're playing online anonymously. So then what are the additional barriers do you, do you think that prevent more women to participate in these sort of programs? I think we got to, I think we got to get people young. Okay. Right? The college level is already like, if you look at the college level, it's like those people are old compared to the average esports player on the professional scene. Right. Sure. So it's just, it's just, it's just a kind of different way of formalizing an amateur scene, I think is what the college scene is. I think it's, um, so I think we, you know, we've got to, if you go start getting into schools, let's, yeah. let's get into schools ahead of them and, and kind of, you know, do proper interventionist work. Okay. Okay. So we have um, one last question and this one is directed specifically to Maddie. <laughs> so we'll just end with, we'll just end with that. Maddie, are you ready for it? It's what yeah. are the barriers that prevent female gamers from raising their, vo their own voice for raising their voice? That's a good question, actually. Um, it is. Uh, one I could think of right off uh, the back, I guess, is I guess from my own experience, what I would say stopped me from raising my voice about the toxicity or the issues um, that happen in the esports scene is for years on end, since I've been a gamer, I've been torn down or knocked down because of my gender. What makes people think that I will speak up if I've been knocked down so much just because of the fact that I'm a female? 
you're tearing down my self-confidence. I'm not going to come out and speak about what's been bothering me since it's been an issue for so long. That got personal and emotional. Oh, but I think, but I it's think real, a lot of though. people, yeah. a lot of people, a lot of females, a lot of women can connect to it because yeah. uh, I, I saw this tweet the other day from one of my friends competing in um, female CSGO. And it was like, why should I continuously speak about what, has been knocking me down for so long. It was something of that sort. And it's that people keep judging her for being a female in gaming. What's the point of having female only tournaments? And she just said, I'm going to stop speaking about this because like finish, nobody cares, you know? And I think from my experience, that's what I can share. I'm sure everyone has their own opinion on this. Yeah, I think that's actually really, that's a very good point. And I uh, I empathize. Yes, I've tried to sort of been dead on that. I also saw recently a really good tweet by um, I think the IGL from Fanatics Valorant team who was calling out poor behavior that someone was exhibiting towards another female player and having sort of the guys on our side calling them out. I think that actually kind of helps to raise our voice, right? Because then we can see that we're we're not fighting this battle on our own. Yeah, Maddie, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, no, to touch on that. And it's so right. We're not fighting this battle on our own. And I'm so happy when guys do stick up for us. But what guys need to stop, we get the bullying, okay? We get the toxicity. But then guys are toxic to those guys who defend the girls, calling them sips and stuff. Yeah. They're next level. There's no stopping to this. (laughs) Yeah. it's, it's It's a toxic circle. And it'll, it'll take a long time to, I guess, really change the way we, we treat women and other uh, minority groups. But um, with that, I, I know that we're one minute over our time. But thank you so much, everyone, for coming today, for sharing your thoughts, bringing your experience, bringing your insights and being honest about how we can sort of move, uh, continue to influence the scene as women and how we can move forward. Um, yeah. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you to the, to the audience. Uh, we're gonna off stream now but thanks for attending everybody and catch us on our next panel next Thursday same time 5 p.m london time and it's all wave bye and I'm gonna stop streaming now Stop watching, stop watching, stop watching, stop watching.